So in the last book, which was called American Mania, I actually explored the American experience from the standpoint of migration. Uh, I'm a migrant. I came from Britain uh, decades ago now and have always been fascinated by America, and it's, uh, uh, which I see as the great experiment of the Enlightenment. But, you know, that book was actually started around the time of the dot-com bubble and its bursting. Uh, when everybody was crazy. You know, we were all manic. It's a metaphor, of course, but we were all manic. So that was American mania, when more is not enough. And then, as it, it sort of predicted that we were going to go down the spout, and we did in 2008. Suddenly the financial implosion occurred. And so that started me thinking again. And this is really the sequel. This is the sequel to American mania, which takes the idea that if we know really who we are, why is it we can't construct a better society? And what is it that is about us? What is the way that we're wired up that makes us behave the way we do? So it's a mystery story, really, but it's an optimistic mystery story. You know, the human brain is not a single organ, it's a hybrid, you know. So there's an old part of the brain which is reward-driven and very self-centered. And there's another part of the brain which has been layered on top just to couple of hundred thousand years ago, which we call the cortex, the frontal cortex, which is the inhibitory part. So if you think about the market, on one side you've got the driver, yes, which is curiosity and self-interest. On the other side you have a social integration, which keeps the old brain from getting out of line. And so what has happened in our modern society, where the system is driving all of us to doing more and more and more and more, and making it easier to do more and more and more. The reward system is completely out of line, and the brakes have essentially burnt out. So we've got no brakes, and we've got a big engine that's driving us, and so we have bubbles all the time. So the market bubble on the outside is like a market bubble on the inside. And if you understand the way the brain works, you can understand why we're in such a fix. Yeah, a well-tuned brain is a balanced brain, you see. And that means that the old brain and the new brain are working together, essentially, in a balanced way. Well, unfortunately, in a society where the driver is towards the old brain, the balance gets lost. And once the balance is lost, everything falls apart, basically. Why do I call it the well-tuned brain? And so. It's basically a, a, a riff on the well-tempered clavier, you know, which is J.S. Bach's teaching uh, music to students back in the late 1700s. The interesting thing about the clavier, the harpsichord in those days, is you had to tune it all the time. And so it's a metaphor which says, we have to tune our brains. Habits are the way the brain gets tuned. It gets tuned. So if you actually you come up with habits which are bad for you, then your brain isn't tuned very well. And when you sit at the, the orchestra, sit at the, you sit at the piano or the harpsichord to play it, it doesn't sound right. And that's exactly what happens to us. You know, the unique thing about the human brain is that we are extraordinarily creative. Thomas Hobbes, who was this philosopher back in the 1600s, said very profoundly, he said, you know, a dog can see a horse, yes. And dog can also see a man. But there's no dog that has ever put the man and the horse together to make a centaur. That's imagination. That is uniquely human. And in fact, it didn't really get going until 50 or 60,000 years ago, when you find those wonderful cave paintings in southern France, for example, or in Australia. So imagination is the key to everything. It's the key to the city we live in. It's the key to the technology we use. It's amazing. But that is the fundamental difference between us and the rest of the animals. Now, we should be celebrating that imagination, but we should also be careful because it can take us down interesting paths where we sort of lose our humanistic understanding. We lose communication with each other. You know, who has 500 friends on Facebook? Do you really know 500 people on Facebook? No, of course you don't. M most people have intimate friends, five to 10. Close friends, maybe 10 to 50, but nobody has 500 friends. But we imagine we do because of this technology that enables us to 
see all these names and communicate with all these people, but they're not really intimate friends. It changes the nature of the human beast to consider them all friends. <laughs> I mean, this, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. To be together, but not to be together. You know, the fascinating thing to me is every time you have your cell phone on in a restaurant and it rings and you pick it up, you hang up on the person who's sitting next to you. It's classic. And this is modern society. And we think we are in touch with everybody, whereas you can see in your wonderful photographs, we're not in touch with people at all. We're all busily in touch with something that is the abstract through our little handheld machine. Intriguing. Yeah, these, these are perfect. You should, be, you should put these in a film and publish them. I, it's dating a la mode, the, exactly. The evolution of man, and we are walking along looking at our cell phones. You can see that on the campus all the time. Children, because they are children, I think, they, they walk into each other, I mean literally, because they're not looking up. When you're tuning the brain, the most important part of tuning it is your attachment to other people. The fact is that if you have an educational system that inserts a tablet between you and the teacher. It doesn't work as well as when the teacher is really present. You know, I don't know about you, but if I think back to what I learned in school, I can't remember a thing about what it was that I actually learned. But I do remember the teachers, and I remember the people who really influenced me very, very clearly. And so my thesis is that teaching has got something to do with the attachment between people. And it, it builds from infancy. You see, the early attachment to your parents then builds a sense of trust. And beyond trust, it builds into a sense of personal command. Because if somebody trusts you and teaches you, you then command yourself. And ultimately, you learn things from them. And that is repeated again and again and again during the early phase of childhood and adolescence. But the key to that is attachment. And so it's not the content, it's the way you feel about the person that enables you to learn the content. Because ultimately, you teach yourself. My sense is, when it comes to sustainability, you know, there's an enormous amount of stuff written about the, these days because we're all getting a little scared, yes? However, I think that it all starts with the individual. And if you build a person and we know how to do it, who does have a well-tuned brain, then you're able to think through together, all of these individuals working together, to create a future that is mindful and sustainable because we each respect each other and so on. The way change occurs socially, I think, is not... It takes great leaders, but it, great leaders always fall flat unless there is a movement among everybody, in a democracy anyway, which enables you to go forward. And so there are islands of understanding that occur. And they're occurring in America all the time. And they're, they're getting stronger. And so there are islands of people who really do believe that we have to do such and such. And they do respect each other. And they believe that perhaps getting back to feeding ourselves with real food rather than industrialized food that having cities where you can actually bump into people, not by holding a cell phone, but by talking to them, these are the sorts of things that ultimately, I think, will coalesce and create a social movement. That's what will be the root of a sustainable change. So in my book, for example, this last book, I talk about um, uh, uh, this woman who's a yachts, a yachts woman. She got a damehood, the same as a knighthood in England, for sailing around the world faster than any other, any other individual f several years ago. She tells this wonderful story about how she's in the middle of the ocean. All she's got is a certain amount of water, a certain amount of food, and she's miles and miles from anywhere. And she realizes that sustainability is being frugal and understanding where she's going and figuring out how she can do it by herself. If you get a whole bunch of people doing that, they will eventually find some communion, and then you've got a sustainable culture. The way I see that is I think it's the early part of some conscious awareness that things aren't going too well. You know, the interesting thing about mindfulness, if you strip it away, it's not hocus-pocus, it actually is useful. It's the way in which the old brain 
and the new brain talk to each other. So think about it. The old brain, as we sit here, is keeping us breathing. I haven't been thinking about the fact that I need to breathe 25 you know, times a minute, and I haven't been thinking about how I keep my heart pumping. That's all automatic. That's all the habit that is developed into the brain when we're born, and we embellish it, of course, as we grow up. But that particular set of habits, if you focus on it, just let's focus on breathing for a moment, you think suddenly about breathing. You concentrate on your breathing. In order to do that, you use your new cortex to think about your breathing. And if you concentrate on it long enough, it begins to exclude the world around you, yes? You begin to bring these two parts of your brain together. Now, it'll wander off, but you can bring it back. And if you do that, this is the practice of mindfulness. And so then, together, you begin to reduce your blood pressure, you reduce the way that the tension is running through your body, et cetera, et cetera. The people who practice this now in America, I think, are beginning to realize that they have to do something because their life is so damn frenetic. They're killing themselves, literally, many of them. I mean, this is the first generation where people are going to be dying younger than their parents, yes? It's a, it's, it's a bad story. So I think mindfulness has its place. It's, at the moment, a sort of uh, an antidote, a, um, uh, 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 a crisis mode uh, uh, f that tries to bring us back to some sort of self-understanding.